So the March NSDA topic is going to be resolved single-gender classrooms would improve the quality of education in American public schools. Like usual, going to start with just some general thoughts, then specific wording, then specific arguments and things that might factor into side choice and case construction. So, for starters, the topic area for March was going to be gender issues. This was the only two March topics that mentioned gender, so it's not really a huge surprise that it got picked. This topic seems to lean slightly to the con because there's a lot more empirical defenses of the status quo, whereas most of the pro stuff is either hypothetical or is confined to private schools in a way that makes gathering conclusive pro evidence difficult. So I think the con overall is going to have an easier time on this topic in front of the majority of judges who attended coeducational public schools. That said, pro does have a lot of ways to narrow the debate down but each of those carries a hidden cost to pro as well. So with that said, let's talk about the wording of the topic, because there's a couple word choices that are very important. In particular, the topic says gender and not sex, classrooms and not schools, would improve is not a question of can we do this, or would this be legal, or would this be something an American public education is designed to do, a hypothetical question of if this were to happen, would it result in an improvement? And then public schools, which could mean K through 12, could mean state universities, could mean Head Start preschools, and there's a lot of potential variation there as well. But the majority of these debates, I suspect, are going to focus on high schools because they're going to be debated in high schools by high schoolers. So generally speaking, this is what the topic will be about, but that's not what the topic needs to be about. So let's look at each of these distinctions in a little bit more detail. Sex is just a question of anatomy or biology. Gender is more a question of culture or identity. Sexuality is a different category from both of those. When we are talking about gender, we're talking about what someone identifies as, what society views them as. We are not necessarily talking about were they born biologically male, were they born biologically female. So there are some distinctions there that will become important as we talk through the arguments. Classrooms instead of schools matter because the children can still be in a co-educational environment. The school itself might have members of both genders within it, but the classrooms themselves, and not necessarily all classrooms either, maybe some classrooms in the school, maybe electives, maybe opt-in, there's a bunch of variations of how this could go, but maybe those would be single gender. So students may still have the benefits of co-educational extracurriculars, may still have the benefits of co-educational socialization, but may have certain classrooms that are single gender. The most common example of this in public education and status quo is many gym classes are gender segregated in public schools. On the other hand, segregating just classrooms and not schools as a whole really reduces the number of examples that PRO has to draw upon. So that's not necessarily the best strategy, but it certainly is one that can be talked about with nullifying a lot of cons offense by, well, this only happens when they opt in, or this only happens to students who want it. There are a bunch of studies, for instance, that talk about how students learn better under a teacher of the same gender as them. But that's not necessarily going to be possible for every child to have unless you have single gender classrooms. And again, that also varies subject by subject. So you can certainly argue that this subject, it's important for them to be integrated. This subject, the benefits of single gender matter more. And classrooms could be a way to do that. The other thing here is the concept of classrooms as space and talking about safe spaces, especially for certain groups who are at risk, most particularly talking about women, but also more obscure gender identities as well. So aside from that, let's look at would improve. When we're talking about whether something would improve the quality of education, we're not saying it will be done. This resolution is kind of asking you to conduct a thought experiment. It's borrowing fiat from policy debate, essentially. Imagine this if it were enacted, what would the world look like? This lends itself to a lot of world of the pro versus world of the con final focus speeches, but it also means that con can't say, for instance, oh, well, according to this state's constitution, according to this title of U.S. code, it's not legal for us to do this with public schools. That is not the question of the resolution. Something can be against current regulations, but also would improve the quality of education. These things are not mutually exclusive, and 
Khan proving it is not feasible or not allowed does not make Khan right, so Khan needs to go a little bit farther than that. The next phrase is the quality of education. In the debate, this phrase is important because it is what includes or excludes impacts. And there are two questions on this. The second biggest question is how do we measure the quality of education? And that decides what evidence teams can or can't use and what arguments to the other teams you do or do not need to answer to win the round. The biggest question under this is what is the role of education? What is the goal of American public schools? Is this different than the goal of private schools? Do we measure quality of education in different ways? Is it a question of getting the best scores? Is it a question of having the most educated workforce? Is it a question of teaching people to be productive members of society, to be good citizens, to play well with others? There's certainly a lot of variation here in what that can mean, and that allows a very diverse set of impact framing between the different sides, which is going to need to be reconciled somewhere in the rebuttal or the summary. So aside from that, American probably means the U.S. There's not too much else there that you can really spin off of this. The topic is being debated only in the U.S. really. It's being decided by U.S. organization. It's being debated predominantly by high schools qualifying for the United States National Championships. So while American could mean a bunch of other things, there's no reason too proactively assume that it should mean anything else on this topic. Aside from that, pro can go narrow, but if they do go narrow, they say, well, only some classrooms and not the whole schools and only some classes, and it's only opt-in, and we'll defer to the parents or the students' concept of gender, then most of the benefits of the studies that they would talk about are going to apply because the majority of those are talking about entire schools that are segregated on sex not certain classrooms within schools that are separated by gender. If you do that, then you lose access as pro to a lot of the evidence, but the debate kind of becomes more of a game of assertions. You get to spike out of a lot of con offense, but you also spike out of the warrants for a lot of yours. And if you are a better speaker and are better at painting a picture of what your world would look like, that might be the stronger option on pro. On the other hand, if you are pro and you tend to be more evidence meta-analysis based, if you like comparing the warrants of your studies to theirs, if you like talking about in-depth studies and what authors actually mean when they write their articles, then you probably want to take the broader stance on pro-side and talk a lot about how these single-sex schools are showing better results and here are some positive correlations as to why that people think might have a causal link which is stronger than the causal links on the other side. Khan, unfortunately, can do both of these things at once. They don't need to pick and choose. They can use studies, and they can use a lot of just more rhetorical arguments without needing to pick and choose until later speeches. The Khan case can be more internally coherent, and that's one of the reasons that I think the Khan side has a bigger advantage. That said, there's two particular kinds of studies I want to talk about because I mentioned them in the past. One is studies that say X has no observable effect. And that's a very common way that Pro is going to try and negate a lot of Khan's offense, and vice versa. Don't be discouraged if you see one of these studies. Don't be really excited if you see one of these studies. All the study is saying is we need more information, which can be found in other studies. All the study is saying is this author didn't have enough information to draw a conclusion one way or another. Absence of evidence and evidence of absence are not the same thing. So for instance, there is, I want to say, a University of Wisconsin study that says that there are no observable benefits to single-sex education. That doesn't mean the debate is over. It does mean that to get around that study, the other team needs to talk about what they don't consider observable benefits, what benefits they were not looking for, and what ways they might not have compared it. Also, there's a bunch of studies that say, we don't see anything one way or the other, and one study that says, we clearly see something this way, that study is probably the tiebreaker because no observable benefits is just defense. It is not offense for the other side, they still need a drawback to your side to win the debate. The second thing to be aware of is studies that don't control for funding, parental choice, or the resources available to students. 
because those are fairly common. Overall, single-sex schools have higher test scores than integrated schools. That doesn't mean that single-gender classrooms are inherently good or bad. It does mean that the vast majority of those schools are private schools with rich parents who are investing their child's education, the schools have large budgets, small class sizes, and don't have to take any students they don't want. That's certainly going to skew the data. A lot of studies will say, we corrected for all data. You can't really correct for all data. You can't really isolate all variables. So it's important to know which the studies do and do not. The biggest one to worry about is, does it adjust for funding? Does it compare schools of both categories that have the same amount of resources available to them? The second biggest is, are these schools opt-in? Is one a school that has to take any student, while the other is one of the only parents who really care about their child's education at home and at school, willingly send their children to, and does that create a more motivated student base? But there's a bunch of ways that these can vary, so always be aware of what common studies your opponents might say and what variables it might or might not control from. If they don't mention the controls for variable, you should probably have a block ready in your rebuttal that assumes they don't and forces them to show that they do adequately control for it. Again, though, beyond measurable progress through grades, through standardized test scores, through graduation rates, through college acceptances, there's also intangible as well, which serve as useful tiebreakers if both sides have conflicting evidence. That doesn't mean don't contest your opponent's evidence, but it does mean only contest your opponent's evidence when you're doing so to make evidence of yours look better in contrast, and you are likely to use the evidence in the final focus to try to win the round. Otherwise, it is better to go around instead of through the fight of competing studies. And the best way to do that is usually talking about something that isn't necessarily quantifiable, but is a valuable goal of education to your side. For instance, the question of, do single gender classrooms reify or challenge gender roles? Do they encourage people to act more as stereotypes of their gender? Do they free them from the expectation of acting a certain way in front of someone of the other gender? Do they become increasingly heteronormative? Do they allow people more space to be themselves and break down those norms? And there's certainly conclusions both ways on each of these. There is also certainly going to be some pro teams who argue that reifying certain gender roles is a good thing and challenging others are. The con side is pretty much always going to argue that challenging them is a good thing, that flexibility in society is good, and that breaking down gender roles allows for a more integrated workforce where everybody has more equal opportunity. The pro side certainly has the option to argue other perspectives on this, though if you do, again, I would be very careful how you do so. Remember, this isn't just an isolated hypothetical topic. There are going to be people debating this topic who, if they were in a single gender classroom, would have to either out themselves as transgender or be in the wrong classroom. There are people debating this topic who are all across the spectrum of sexuality. Sure, only one in around 10 and a half, 11,000 people has gender dysphoria, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that nobody you're debating knows anyone or is related to anyone who does. That also means that you want to be very careful how you characterize any issues surrounding gender, specifically because you don't know how your judge feels about them, which means it's better to be respectful, it's better to be cautious, it's better to not make assumptions you don't need to make, just as if you're having a conversation about this in real life. Overall, I think that the strongest pro case is either going to be one that takes a lot of content by surprise and straight up argues for sex segregated education throughout schools and not just classrooms, or one that takes a narrow point of view and focuses on the different reasons for boys versus for girls that single gender classrooms are good in terms of fighting existing gender stereotypes, in terms of receptiveness to different teachers, in terms of creating safe spaces. I think pro can do well with either of those, but I still think that con's flexibility and judges' increased personal familiarity with what con is advocating for is going to make con overall the slightly stronger side. Con cases have a bunch of different ways to be strong, 
I don't think I need to outline a bunch of them here. If you're having trouble coming with points for a con case, by all means, leave me a comment, shoot me an email, send me a message. There's plenty of ways to reach me, not least of which is the comments right below this video. So let me know if you're having trouble with specific arguments for either side. Generally speaking, it's going to be either a challenge of studies going through each other's evidence, or just a question of what we prioritize that isn't quantifiable going around each other's evidence. Hope that helps. Best of luck at NSDA and NCFL qualifiers, which most states have, most dioceses have on this topic this month. And I will see you soon to talk about the April topic.